Meine Damen und Herren. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So everyone is already having a discussion. This is a good sign. It's quite good that we can meet in person at the Foreign Policy Conference, which allows us to have better conversations. So welcome to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. My name is Imme Scholz, and since April last year, I've been the new co-president together with Jan Philipp Albrecht, who will welcome you after the lunch break. With today's final event, our 23rd Foreign Policy Conference will come to an end. And we are quite happy that so many friends of our foundation have made it here. Today's um, topic, the new security situation in Eastern Europe um, and the war in Eastern Europe um, has been a topic that um, is quite a, a difficult topic. Germany's self-image is the image of a civil power. The Greens have their base in the peace movement. And since the end of the uh, Cold War, we all hoped that despite all difficulties, we could work together with Russia on a European peace order. However, this hope was shattered by the Russian attack on Ukraine. So now we have to understand this new situation with all its uh, consequences for Europe, for the transatlantic relationship and the international relations altogether. Namely, that in the foreseeable future, there will not be unanimity with Russia. Now we rather see um, an opposition against Russia or opposing Russia. So, in the course of the so-called Zeitenwende, we have to raise several questions. And some of the questions actually uh, focus on the DNA of the German, also the green foreign policy. At first glance, it affects our pacifist uh, roots, our self-understanding as a bridge builder between opposing blocks and also our civil conflict management. However, at a second glance, it also affects the new or the readjustment um, of debates. For example, a legitimate intervention and the responsibility to protect, because without um, keeping in mind the UN Charter and strong regional uh, security architectures, we will not be able to make headway, as Ambassador Kimani told us in our meeting two days ago. The foreign policy debates of the past months evolved around supplying heavy weapons, battle tanks, howitzers. Uh, all these are terms that we were not very familiar with in the past. And as at the end of the 1990s, when it was about the Kosovo mission, it also evolves around the responsibility of Germany for Eastern Europe, also against the background of the German uh, war of aggression more than 80 years ago. So the ones derive from this responsibility the necessity to show restraint when it comes to military support for Ukraine. The others demand quite the contrary. So the atrocities of the German Wehrmacht of 80 years ago require the utmost support for Ukraine today. This is what they, the others say. So this brings us to the first topic of our session. So how do we want to act today and support Ukraine in its fight for survival as an independent and sovereign state? What kind of protection can we provide to other U Eastern European countries that are being under threat by Russia, that are being destabilized by Russia? The question does not only pop up today, but also tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, because it's quite clear that Moscow does not want to uh, let the former satellite states of the Soviet Union become really independent. And in terms of the uh, prospect, how can a cooperation with Russia look like that really affects the roots of this insecurity. So 
we will have to ask and answer these questions time and again. So we have to look ahead and we have to face up to this new reality, the immediate reality. How can we help these states to maintain their sovereignty and also their territorial integrity uh, against this Russian new imperialism? And there is not a simple answer to it. But we as Germans, as the Greens, we are demanded to provide answers. We need to give answers. This is why today's event will be very interesting. This morning we will look at the region with a security policy um, perspective and we are quite happy that Anders Fock Rasmussen, the former NATO Secretary General, uh, is here. He has worked on a security concept for Ukraine, which he will discuss with us today. So thank you very much for that. In the early afternoon, the uh, foreign minister will talk to us and we are all looking forward to it. And afterwards, we will raise the major questions in terms of the German and Green foreign policy and it's worthwhile staying here. So I wish all of you an interesting uh, conference. And now I would like to ask our first uh, main speaker, Anders Fock Rasmussen, from 2001 till 2009. He has been Danish Minister President and afterwards um, Secretary General of NATO until 2014. And since the end of his office as NATO Secretary General, he has been an independent policy advisor and analyst for democracy and security questions. He has also been an advisor of the former Ukrainian President Poroshenko and recently, together with Anja Yarmak, the head of the Chancellery of President uh, Zelensky, he, he has worked on a security concept for Ukraine. So, Mr. Rasmussen, welcome to the Foundation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. Um, and let me start by expressing my very strong appreciation of the stance of the German Green Party. I know that there are many representatives of the Green Party in this room. Um, <clears throat> I think your commitment to uh, human rights, the rule of law, uh, rules-based uh, world order um, has been strong in opposition and now also in government. Uh, I really appreciate that. I, if I were a German, it would be hard for me to choose between, I mean, FDP is my, belong to my political family. But it might be that if I were German, I would run for the Greens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but niceties aside, let me go directly to the point. Um, Putin must not be allowed to win the war in Ukraine. <clears throat> If he gets success in Ukraine, he won't stop. Next, he would take Moldova, then Georgia, and eventually put pressure on the three Baltic states, in particular Lithuania, to create a corridor from motherland Russia uh, to the Russian enclave uh, Kaliningrad. Um, and if, if he gets success, if he gets away with taking land from his neighbor, that would send an extremely dangerous signal to autocrats across the world. Xi Jinping would conclude, okay, if Putin can get away with taking Crimea and or uh, Donbass, then I'll try Taiwan, why not? Um, so it would send a dangerous message. Um, and the rules-based world order will collapse and it won't be the rule of law, but the rule of the strongest that govern the world. That's why it's needed 
that we deliver all the weapons that Ukrainians need. Um, let me thank wholeheartedly the German government for the decision not only to deliver Leopard tanks itself, but also to allow other countries to um, deliver Leopard tanks. Having said that, I'm very much disappointed to see how difficult it is to build this famous tank coalition. So, finally, Germany took a very important decision. I had expected other countries, all the European countries, to follow suit. We have 2,000 Leopard tanks in Europe, so we could easily send 200, 300, as requested by Ukrainians, to Ukraine and still be well protected. Um, so our, uh, my plea is now you should deliver those Leopard tanks and build that uh, tank coalition. Um, and in general, I think we should never ever exclude anything. We have, now we have a discussion on fighter jets and I don't know what will uh, happen down the road. But I, my attitude would be not to exclude anything because whenever we exclude anything, we leave an increased room maneuver for Putin to accelerate the war. <clears throat> um, and the incremental approach, the step-by-step -step approach, doesn't work. You cannot win a war by pursuing a step-by-step -step or an incremental uh, approach. You have to surprise your adversary. You have to overwhelm your adversary. Um, now, it's important to follow up so that we don't just focus on the near term. It's of utmost importance to deliver the weapons um, the Ukrainians need. They have the will to fight. It's our obligation to give them the means to fight. Uh, but we also have to do what we can to avoid a Russian attack, a Russian invasion in the future. We have to build a security architecture in Europe that ensures peace and stability on the European continent. I had never ever expected in my lifetime to experience what we are witnessing now uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. Um, and that's why uh, in May last year, I was asked to co-chair an international group together with the chief of staff of the presidential administration to elaborate proposals as to how we can uh, give Ukraine security guarantees in the future. We worked hard over the summer and in September, I went to Kiev and presented to President Zelensky a set of proposals. The principle is very simple. It is to make Ukraine capable of defending itself by itself. And to that end, we need four elements. Firstly, we should help the Ukrainians build a strong military, so strong that they can withstand any future Russian attack. Secondly, we should enhance intelligence cooperation between Ukraine and its partners. Thirdly, um, we should sustain joint training and exercises under EU flag and NATO flag. And four, we should help the Ukrainians build a strong defense industry so that they can produce weapons themselves to make Ukraine capable of defending itself by itself. And the idea is that a group of international guarantors a pledge to deliver to Ukraine the capabilities needed to uh, fulfill those goals. Why is the Kiev Security Compact so important? Firstly, 
we have a clear interest in developing a strong and stable Eastern European partner as a bulwark against an increasingly uh, aggressive uh, Russia. Um, that is the most efficient way to ensure peace and stability on the European continent. Secondly, it is a prerequisite for starting reconstruction and rebuilding of Ukraine in earnest that we have a secure environment, that we have long-term security guarantees. Otherwise, uh, private investors will be reluctant to invest in Ukraine. Um, the Ukrainian government estimates that the cost of rebuilding what Putin has destroyed will amount to 700 billion euros. It's a huge amount of money, and we can't do that without engaging the private sector, but that would take long-term security guarantees. Thirdly, I think we need a more long-term strategy instead of this step-by-step -step approach. I noted that Chancellor Scholz expressed frustration because um, as soon as he had decided to deliver the Leopard tanks, he was met by a request to deliver or support the delivery of fighter jets. In a way, I understand his frustration. Uh, and that's why we, we need a long-term strategy. Also for parliaments, actually, to plan uh, the uh, investment. Um, furthermore, uh, Chancellor Schultz expressed a desire to see the Americans join Germany in a tank coalition, so to speak, uh, because Germany doesn't want to go it alone. In a way, I also understand that. And uh, the Kiev Security Compact provides a framework for collective action. So Germany or other countries won't have to go it alone. Uh, finally, NATO will have a summit in July this year in Vilnius. And no doubt that the question of Ukrainian membership of NATO will be tabled. We also know that uh, there will be a potential split within NATO. Some allies will support Ukrainian membership, others will be skeptical or 100% against. I think it would be devastating to show a split and weakness um, in the eyes of Putin. So it's of utmost importance to keep the unity. Um, and I think the Kiev Security Compact could build the bridge from now until Ukraine down the road may be able to join NATO. And that's why I have been in Berlin. I met with uh, members of Bundestag yesterday uh, I met with the Greens, I met with the Social Democrats, um, I also met Wolfgang Schmidt, uh, who is quite influential. Um, and uh, I realized that there are more than nuances in the German approach. Um, but I appeal to you as Greens to move forward on this Kiev security compact. As concluding remarks, uh, some days ago I was asked the following question. Can the price for defending freedom be too high? Can the price for defending freedom be too high? I was surprised to get that question. Um, because you can always get peace if you're willing to bow your neck. Um, and we should never ever give in to nuclear blackmail. Those who give in to nuclear blackmail are condemned to live in slavery under the stick and pleasure of the nuclear master. 
we should learn the lesson that appeasement with dictators does not lead to peace, but to war and conflict because their appetite is endless. So, while peace is precious, I have to say, freedom is priceless. Um, so that's why we should stand up against the world's autocrats. And that's why back in 2017, I established the foundation, the Alliance of Democracies Foundation, to create a framework for a discussion among political leaders, business leaders, academia, on how we can strengthen cooperation between the world's democracies. The world's democracies represent more than 60% of the global economy. That's a formidable force, provided that we can stay united. So, once again, I would like to thank the Green Party in Germany for your steadfast support for fundamental principles of uh, rule of law uh, and a rules-based world order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rasmussen. I'm Georgia Franceschini. I'm the desk officer for foreign and security policy at the Bell Foundation. And I would like to ask our panelists to come on stage now. And while they're getting seated, allow me to introduce the facilitator, Dr. Frank Sauer. He's a politologist and military expert. He teaches and researches at uh, the University of the Armed Forces in Munich. Many of you might have uh, known him as a very successful podcast uh, author. He is the author of uh, Sicherheitshalber, a security policy po uh, podcast. And he also runs the FAZ podcast where he presents very good analysis about the situation in Ukraine. For us in the foundation, Frank is not a new face. When I started working for the foundation five years ago, Frank was the head of an international expert group with the wonderful task, uh, title, um, Task Force for Disruptive uh, technologies in uh, 21st century warfare. He dealt with uh, autonomous weapon system that we sometimes call killer robots, and he wrote a study with co-authors, and a few copies of that study can still be found in print at the entrance. It's a study that was made a couple of years ago, but it's still a valid and relevant study, and uh, we were one of the first organizations in 2017 to come up with such a study. So I hand over to you, Frank, and we are going to have a bilingual discussion here on the panel in German and in English. May I inform you, you can get headsets to get simultaneous interpretation. And uh, Frank, I hand over to you now. Thank you for this very kind introduction and for the wonderful advertising you gave me. Indeed, I'm going to speak German. Most people on the panel are going to speak German, and all of you who need translation, who need interpretation, will have a headset. Let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we have just heard Mr. Ras uh, Rasmussen. Thank you for being with us. You do not have much time left, uh, about 20 minutes or so. So uh, Mr. Rasmussen will have to go early because he's got another appointment. Next to Mr. Rasmussen, we have... Uh, uh, Mina Orlander, she is a researcher at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, lived in Germany for uh, 10 years, worked at uh, SVP in Berlin, and she is uh, the tank expert. Then we have a woman everybody knows, Agnieszka Brugga. She is a member of the Green Parliamentary Group and is a member of the Defense Committee. And next to me, Orisia Lutsevich a research fellow at the Chatham House in London, the Chatham House that invented the Chatham Rules, and she heads the Ukraine Forum. Rule. 
Herr Rasmussen, vielen Dank. Mr. Rasmussen, thank you once again for talking to us and sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, thanks for uh, mentioning the uh, Chief Security Compact. Before I give the floor to you, I'd like to ask our other panelists, are, any, are there any responses to the speech of Mr. Rasmussen? I mean, we're here at the Green Party, and when you gave your explanation, I had to think of Eagle, uh, of course. Uh, um, the Green Party is a party that usually ha carries the symbol of the hedgehog, and we care for the environment and for the species. And you talked about equipment, weapons, uh, training, intelligence, cooperation, and the defense industry. Now, what does that mean? The Ukraine would be like a hedgehog, very difficult to attack. But oftentimes, you mentioned also the term security guarantees. Did we all together abandon the idea that European countries, NATO members, and the United States once again might have to give certain guarantees to Ukraine when it comes to military assistance obligations? I mean, we have the Budapest Memorandum and everything that came afterwards. Uh, is it no longer possible to give such security guarantees? Would any security given by a security guarantee given by Germany and the EU no longer credible? Very clear difference between the Budapest Memorandum and the Key Security Compact. Uh, the Budapest Memorandum, as you all know, uh, was signed by three guarantor states, namely Russia, the US, and the UK back in 1994. The background was Ukraine gave up her nuclear weapons, handed them actually over to Russia. In exchange, um, Ukraine received security guarantees, namely the three guarantor states pledged not to attack Ukraine. Well, we all know that Russia violated uh, that pledge. The Kiev Security uh, so you might say that the Budapest Memorandum provides negative security guarantees. The guarantor state pledged to refrain from doing something. The Kiev Security Compact provides positive security guarantees because the guarantor states pledge to actually deliver capabilities to make uh, Ukraine more safe, more secure, guarantee its uh, security, and avoid a future uh, uh, Russian uh, attack. Uh, I know very well that the Green Party in Germany uh, has uh, a legacy of uh, uh, so I would say a pacifist uh, legacy, uh, etc. But I don't think there is any contradiction between that and to conclude that to maintain peace, you need to be prepared for war. Um, so I think the green policies in this respect are coherent and consistent. Vielen Dank. Reaktion. Um, Ulisa Lutsevich, Light. Thank you very much. Ulisa Lutsevich heads the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House in London, and my impression is that she would like to react. Thanks very much, Frank. Uh, thanks, um, Mr. Rasmussen, for developing that Kiev Compact. I think it's very important to have something on the table as we are uh, in search of uh, resolving Ukraine's security dilemma because it has not been resolved since the collapse of the Soviet Union. I just would like to reiterate what you are saying to the audience. So we have to embrace the fact that peace can be achieved by military means. It's very important. And why we are moving towards that military solution is because the way Russia turned. It's not because the way Ukraine is making choices or the way Europe uh, would like to militarize. It's simply because the nature of the Putin's regime that was you know, consolidating this power of security services with consistent 
you know, clamping down on human rights and freedoms and opposition. You know the story, I don't have to tell you. Let's keep in mind that we often underestimate the nature of Russia, and that is why I seek for wrong solutions. And I'm really pleased that you brought in the Budapest Memorandum. I looked at the what Ukrainians think is the best way to protect Ukraine from another attack by, uh, by Russia. And number one, uh, answer is, of course, NATO membership. 86% of Ukrainians today support NATO membership. I think the security compact uh, that you are designing could be indeed a transition to um, a full-fledged membership. Collective security is cheaper. I mean, imagine in every country has to become a hedgehog in Europe. W what kind of world we will be living in? And another thing that is, is a danger is um, the popularity of nuclear status in Ukraine is growing. Because of that betrayal and because of what is happening now in Ukraine. The, so 52% actually in Ukraine think it would be good to have a nuclear status. But when they think about preventing the future aggression, only 17% think so, and compared to this collective security. So let's remember that. What is at stake? What kind of world we will be living in if this proliferation happens and if we, um, we actually uh, make mistakes again? So I think it's a very important moment in European history. Thank you. Reaction. Thank you very much. Any reactions? Well, it's very difficult to ask politicians for reactions that quickly. You um, risk a very lengthy answer. But I would like to thank Mr. Rasmussen that you have uh, mentioned it quite clearly. And we do also see it when it comes to the surveys, whose supporters, whose followers were in favor of tank uh, deliveries. So it's not as if the Green Party would um, do it out of discipline or whatever. It is out of the inside, and it's quite a difficult thing for our party, and it does not change anything about our fundamental values and our ideas. So at the moment, we are in a world um, where we see a conflict between two parties, and we always want to sit down at a negotiation table, negotiating table, in order to solve a conflict, in order to negotiate peace. But despite of that, um, despite of all the crisis that we see in the world, also the climate crisis, we are currently in the situation where one aggressive autocrat has decided not only to push away the solution of all these major problems, but also to throw us back many years and um, consumes so many resources apart from the hard breaking um, suffering that we see on a daily basis in Ukraine. And um, he makes us safeguard our security, so to speak, because he does not want to go to the negotiation table. And um, I am traveling throughout the country um, in the weeks that we do not have parliamentary session in order to discuss with the general public uh, all these topics. And this is why I also thank you for your proposal, because sometimes I um, faced with an opinion where people say, well, and if there are negotiations eventually, then everything is finished. Um, but I think it's very important that we uh, talk about it as well as soon as the violence ends and we start negotiations. It's far away from uh, reality, so to speak, because um, Putin does not want to negotiate, but we cannot go back uh, to the past. So how are we supposed to trust this kind of Russia in the future, even if we negotiate? And this is also why a Budapest memorandum cannot work. So how many times have we last year and also over the last years have been lied to? So this is why we have to find mechanisms that are stricter, that are more clear. And um, I think this is a truth that we have to um, say that um, this situation will not end by ending uh, our military support for Ukraine. It will eventually uh, end no matter in which uh, scenario um, we are after that. So I would also like to hear a few voices from the audience now, because these are the questions that um, are basically coming up on a daily basis. But 
as I have made this mistake, I would now like to ask for another reaction for Agnieszka Broga linked to a critical question. So the Greens are now part of the government. And we are talking about uh, supporting Ukraine become a hedgehog, so to speak. And Mr. Rasmussen quite clearly said that we need a long-term strategy. So now I'm looking at the policies of the federal government. And isn't it true that we are really bad when it comes to that? So we are only thinking in terms of the next week or the next specific uh, um, uh, weapons delivery. And when we have eventually uh, said that we are going to supply these weapons, these martyrs and uh, leopards and others, um, then uh, I hear the statement, well, we now have to count how many do we have. So why aren't we uh, thinking in terms of long-term developments? Where are the political representatives in Germany who can clearly speak out and say that we need to have a completely different European security architecture for the next 30 years, and these are the things that we have to do for that? Well, of course, these kind of discussions do take place. And they do not always take place out in public. And of course, you can also understand that. It also involves so many different variables. It's also difficult. And um, so the proposal is also a little bit vague at the end of the day. What are these security guarantees? And what if something happens? So there are several problems I could discuss here now. But I do not want to um, skip your question, because um, in its core, it's, it's correct what you said. But this is also a necessity, because these decisions cannot be taken lightly. You have to weigh the risks, and the risks of acting, and also the risks of non-acting. You have to come to an agreement uh, in a government, in a coalition. It sometimes takes longer than I would like to, uh, or I would wish for. And also internally, I've made suggestions time and again. Also, last summer, um, I said we should start with a training. We should train the Ukrainians in those systems that we have available. But some were more hesitant. Um, so I think we have to also keep in mind that we have to provide a justification for the equipment that we deliver. I mean, we are not simply delivering tanks. So there's a quite concrete scenario. And I'm also self-critical here when it comes to our government. Um, it's a scenario that we have seen coming, so we should have started much earlier. So this is the threat of a spring offensive, and Ukraine will have to defend itself in this spring. And the tank systems that have been supplied in the course of this ring exchange, um, we will have a huge problem when it comes to the level of protection, but we also lack spare parts and also ammunition. So Ukraine definitely needs these uh, tanks in order to defend itself against this major offensive. And we've seen it for the past weeks, Russia's assembling tanks and also uh, um, soldiers, troops. And um, so we have to discuss that. We have to decide uh, on these things. Um, and we need a long-term European plan on where we want to go. And there are many aspects, many moments where we can feel that there's not always unanimity in the European Union, but also with the Americans and also Ukraine. But we have to have these discussions apart from the many difficult questions that we have to raise on a daily basis. So how about from the outside? So Finland knows quite well where it wants to go. It wants to become a NATO member. And the discussion that we are having here connected to the statement of Chancellor Scholz with regard to the statement that we are calling for, that we are assuming a leading role in Europe. Um, so how about Finland's position in this regard? Well, at the moment, the German leadership role is not really convincing. But of course, we do clearly wish that Germany becomes a reliable partner and becomes even more reliable and that Germany uh, acts in line with its size and contributes to European security in line with its size. And I would like to come back to what Mr. Rasmussen has said here and others. From the Finnish perspective, we have invested 
a lot in this uh, hedgehog strategy. Let's call it like that. Um, Finland has always maintained its own defense capabilities. So, I mean, this has always been a priority. We always wanted to be able to defend our eastern border and protect and defend our territory. But now um, it is about raising the cost of this aggression against um, Finland and of credible deterrence. We cannot do that without NATO. So this is basically the Finnish conclusion from this Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. So in Finland itself, we realized that it's no use cooperating with Russia. We are not at a level playing field here. Even if countries like Finland need a good relationship to Russia, for Russia it's rather nice to have at best. So um, Finland is basically of no major interest to Russia. And if it's in the interest of this uh, major power, um, of course, um, these relations um, are not relevant for Russia. So this is why Finland wants to create as much deterrent as pos possible. And this can be done by a NATO membership. For example, you also mentioned the EU guarantees or what the EU could offer to Ukraine. And the EU lacks two things from my point of view in terms of hard security. And this is Great Britain and the US. And from a German perspective, this is a difficult situation because these two countries are the most important security partners and Germany is not playing a major role here, unfortunately. Well, now I was wondering whether we have gone too far already. So there might also be some voices in the audience who say, what kind of strange consensus is this up on the stage? They all agree we need to turn, we need to um, build up our arms. This is not necessarily what the voters of the Greens do want to have. Is there anyone in the audience um, who would like to say something in this regard, uh, for example, um, well, aren't there any alternatives for it, uh, for example? There are also open letters uh, that are being sent. So, please. Well, I can hardly sit still here, even though if I might be faced with some bashing. I've always sympathized with the Greens. I am the generation of the baby boomers, and I would like to simply say welcome to reality. And I would like to mention two things. I'm a, a psychologist by profession. I just like to say one thing that has been overlooked. So what's the motive and how does a person or what's in the person's mind? I, I'm going to try to be brief. I would like to give you two examples or rather something else. I would like to say in 2014, when um, the Crimea was occupied, I was sitting on a bus in Berlin, and behind me I heard two Russians who were talking, speaking German, traveling to the Rhineland, and they said, well, you have to understand that it has all been Russia in the past. But I, was, I turned around and said, yes, uh, this is what Hitler said, come home to the Reich. And several years later, um, people seem to understand that this was exactly the same mechanism. And I would like to say something else. There was a psychological theory which said if a woman is sexually harassed, then she should rather spread her legs and accept it because then nothing bad would happen to her. But now I'm coming back uh, to, or coming to my end uh, of uh, philosophizing. This is a just a story. A human being had a snake at home, and many others said, well, aren't you afraid of that snakes? And, um, well, that person said, well, you cannot generalize it. I tamed the, the animal, and at one point, the um, animal was so tamed that it was allowed to stay 
in bed with him. And one night he woke up and had a lot of pain. So the snake had bitten him. But then he woke up and asked, so what has happened? I trusted you. We are so close to each other. But then the snake said, well, didn't you know that I'm a snake? So this is just a little story that I wanted to tell you. So thank you very much. This is not actually what I had expected. But it was uh, very interesting, nevertheless. So here in the front row, well, thank you very much. My name is Chok Khoi. I'm the ambassador of the Republic of Moldova uh, here in Berlin. I've got two questions. First, I would like to re remind you of the Second World War and what happened at the time. What if the Allied forces had negotiated for six months if they send uh, 20 or 40 tanks? I assume that the Second World War would wage until today. Just a few figures. 3,000 tanks. The Allied forces provided 3,000 tanks for the Soviet Union, more than 2,000 <laughs> Uh, modern aircraft and 300,000 um, vehicles. So many people already forgot about that, but the famous Katyusha was put on a Stuttgart car from the US and the Soviets only won because of the 99% of the supplied weapons and ammunition of the Allies. And this is also the reason if we um, continue to think along that path, if we only provide weaponry in small doses, the war might wage on for the next 10 years. This costs a lot of lives. Um, the economy of uh, the Ukraine is, is uh, damaged further and further. So how long will we continue to see this homeopathic doses of uh, weapons supplies to Ukraine? This is my first question. And secondly, we had long talked about the sanctions, and this is not really a secret. I mean, this does not have any effect. However, nobody talked about political costs when it comes to Russia. And the second question is, what would you say in the 21st century when there is an aggressor state that is part of the Security Council of the United Nations, so it still has a say at the world uh, level at, um, as a global power? So what would you say about that? Well, excellent. I don't know where you're hinting who the snake is, but I like the, your metaphor very much. You know, once a KGB agent, always a KGB agent. I, and I think this is why he is weaponizing and bringing in, bringing war to Europe. I mean, this is the truth. And, and I think uh, another um, perhaps quite disturbing thought is that this is an unfinished business from the Second World War because we had one tyranny and uh, autocracy being judged and defeated well, uh, and tried in Nuremberg, where another one maintained control over half of, of Europe. Um, and uh, you, the, there were horrible things happening in the periphery of pro proxy wars at that time. And Putin glorifies Stalin. He opens monuments to Stalin. There was never de-Stalinization, de-Sovietization that took place uh, in, uh, in Russia. And I know uh, Eberstiftung and others were trying to have a conversation inside Russia, but then they were deemed foreign agents and kicked out of the country. I mean, I think this is also the disturbing fact, but it puts in a bigger perspective. Um, interesting ambassador and on the reform of the UN, obviously it's, it's a complex issue. But there's one thing that Ukraine is now uh, trying to do, is basically looking for the legal basis for the Russian Federation to be there in the first place. And there's a, um, a clear violation of the UN Charter where the new member of the um, permanent member of the Security Council was not approved by the General Assembly. Unlike, for example, after the collapse of the Yugoslavia, where where there were votes related to um, countries that emerged from that um, uh, formation. So I think we have to be bold and we have to speak 
by force and truth in the eyes to the Russians and not let them pollute uh, international forums and spread disinformation unchallenged. Uh, this is what we have been doing for too long. And when we are thinking about um, our own defenses, and by that I mean in Western uh, Europe, we have to also clean our house. Because what Russia was able to achieve is because they penetrated our democracies from within, through security services, through laundering money, through buying it elite influence, through buying it real estate, investing in I didn't say the word Nord Stream 2 yet, but investing in energy resources. And then all of this is our, you know, our contribution to enabling the aggressor. So I think um, when Ukraine thinks about its um, security, it thinks about military, uh, it thinks about market energy uh, part being part of the European Union. It also thinks about domestic resilience, so cleaning up the house from uh, Russian influence and doing it in the community of, um, of allied um, same way based countries like President Zelensky said yesterday in the European Parliament. We are defending European way of life. In Ukraine, Ukraine wants to transition to green energy. Ukraine wants to respect human rights. What is there not to stand by with Ukraine? It will only expand the space of non-violence in Europe. Agnieszka, the question was, the question was, how long are we going to just uh, give help in homeopathic doses? Uh, let me return to psychology. One psychologist addressed me, uh, and so that is why I was interested when you talked about psychology, but I'm very happy about the way you uh, gave your argument because the other uh, psychologist uh, I talked to, and by the way, let me say, if I ever need psychological support, I'd rather turn to you. And that other psychologist says, if somebody offends you, well, if somebody offends you for no reason, that is uh, not a justification to attack a neighboring country uh, with military force. If I had a say, we would not only have nuclear powers as permanent members of the Security Council, we would have a fairer representation of the world. And yes, uh, Russia would have no place in a Security Council of my making. Of course, uh, first of all, we have to accept that it's the uh, people of Ukraine that is suffering, that is getting, getting attacked and that are dying. And what we also see attacked is our, our common peace order with the rules we have decided for ourselves. And uh, of course, that is why we have a Security Council to uh, make this permanent. And, and that is why we had the Budapest Memorandum, many other uh, treaties we entered into. Um, I have followed that situation and I know how difficult it was to organize this peace order. It was always on our Green Party program. We always said if ever there is a veto blockage in the Security Council, we should address the General Assembly. And I never thought that would be necessary, but now it ha happened already twice. And it takes hard work to uh, really have the General Assembly involved. And uh, I mean, there are many other countries that have a different view on, the con on this conflict. Uh, think of Brazil. Uh, I know some countries are disappointed with the West and uh, there are power structures in, that have been in place for decades. and. Uh, of course, there are also countries who say, where is Europe when it comes to the wars in our region? But on the other hand, it's also that in their interest to make sure that their powerful neighbor doesn't attack them. And I'm really sometimes shocked to see how effective Russia propaganda, Russian propaganda works in the world. Mr. Lavrov succeeds in saying, we cannot deliver food to the world because the Western sanctions doesn't allow us to do that. And uh, two days later, he says, live, we are going to leave the uh, ports in Ukraine alone if you lift the sanctions. So it's a, such an open dishonesty. And the Ukraine 
has to defend itself and still tries to help the uh, people suffering from the earthquake in Syria and uh, Turkey. They also try to bring food to the people that are starving. And that is all in our European interest. Some people don't seem to see that, and that makes me feel frustrated. Yes, of course, I'd like to have quicker decisions. But I also have to say, first of all, of course, the Ukraine uh, would, I do understand uh, Ukraine when they do not just simply say, thanks for the tanks and we leave you alone for some time. Of course, it's a state under attack. It's a country under attack. They have all right to demand more. But I wouldn't say we are just providing help in homeopathic doses. We have supported air defense. We now work for the tank coalition, and there are others who make loud demands but still have to do a lot in order to walk the talk. And I think the way Germany acts has changed. Three or four weeks ago, I would have uh, endorsed the idea of being homeopathic. Now, I don't think this is always the case. Wall Street Journal yesterday said, finally, the Germans decided uh, the leopards are going forward. They, uh, the Germans are giving expert guarantees, but the others um, don't walk the talk. Uh, what happens, Finland? Well, that could now be a long lecture. I try to be as brief as possible. In Finland, we are not yet full NATO members. and. It, there is no scenario of a serious attack in Finland. And if there was a serious attack, the NATO states, even now, would not just silently watch doing nothing. But of course, this mentality in Finland is very deep. For a long, long time, we never expected any help coming from outside. And uh, that changed, of course, first time when we uh, became members of the EU. But still, we still have this mentality of relying on our own devices. That's also the mentality of the Winter War. Uh, Finland was part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, was supposed to become part of the Soviet Union, were attacked by the Soviet Union at the time of the Second World War, but could defend ourselves. And so our idea still is, OK, we have about 200,000 200 leopard tanks, but in contrast to other European countries, these tanks are active. They are being used. Each of the 200 tanks has a certain position and is firmly included in the defense system of our country. 200 tanks for a border of 2,400 kilometers are not so much. And so the idea in Finland is we want to help Ukraine as much as possible, but we can not uh, give away everything without looking at our own defense capabilities. And uh, honestly, I think Finland is no longer alone. And so uh, finally, we should overcome our excessive reliance on our own resources. And I'm absolutely sure that Finland is going to deliver tanks, but Finland is not going to make any public statements about that. And the reason is we do not want to give information to Russia. We don't want them to know how much are we going to have left when we deliver a certain number of tanks. That's also one of the ideas, hiding it from the Russians. Here, Finland and Sweden have had have signed a bilateral agreement during the Rammstein meeting. And uh, the agreement to me looks like a kind of ring exchange scheme. That is to say, Finland can uh, deliver equipment and um, Sweden is going to step in. So as far as Finland's contribution to the Leopard Initiative is concerned, we are only going to have uh, information about that when we mysteriously uh, that some uh, Finnish tanks have become Swedish. Uh, it's not a good communication strategy. It's a kind of strategic non-communication. I'm not a fan of it, but um, this is what we have. When it comes to other countries, 
Well, I'm not so sure why the Netherlands had such high expectations. They do not have any uh, own Leopard tanks, and I think they just have leased 18 of these tanks uh, from Germany. Yes, they have an integrated command with the German armed forces. So it's a bit difficult. Denmark has about 50 of Leopard 2, or less than 50 even. Turkey, Greece, they would have a lot. But since they have not a good relationship, bilateral relationship, they are unwilling to deliver. If they could uh, put their own disputes aside, they could at least deliver a hundred of these tanks or so. So there are certain restrictions, limitations on the part of uh, some countries. I think we should have started much earlier. We should have started negotiating much earlier. So we are only now forming such a coalition. This is very deplorable because we've lost time. When it comes to leopard tanks, of course, the problem was that it demanded a German leadership role because the leopard tank is a German tank. So it's not just about uh, export, export uh, or authorization, but also Germany has to be on board because uh, Germany has the largest stockpiles and has the industry for further production. So it would have been the perfect situation for Germany to get in the lead and start f forming that coalition much earlier, say in October or November. But now we finally have got it, and uh, it seems we are making progress, and many countries are looking at how they can get on board, how they can contribute, and Sweden hasn't said yet anything yet, but I think they're looking into their own resources, and they're looking at uh, maybe the CV-19, the lighter tanks, uh, but of course, uh, it is very deplorable for the Europeans to take so long to happen, to make things happen. Without the United States, it seems to be all in vain. We can't get our act together. So we do not show any kind of uh, European strategic, strategic sovereignty. Absolutely, that last word deserves applause. Now, we were criticized as Europe. Tagesspiegel, in one interview with Chancellor Scholz, there he talked about the extreme situation. He clearly said we have to get in to be in the leading position, in the leading role, but we also need a European sovereignty. Of course, the German French partnership is always important in that light. In that Tagesspiegel interview, he also talked about what he thinks. I mean, indeed, uh, if we want to become more sovereign in Europe, why do we always look at Washington when we talk about uh, tank deliveries? I mean, it would have been logical in the 80s, uh, but in 2021, 2022, that's really amazing. And the chancellor in that interview made statements, uh, and here I understand him, he said, we do not have this European sovereignty. He said it's a project of the future. It will take another 10 years. And I think that's still very op um, optimistic. I don't think we are going to be all aligned and all unanimous in Europe in 10 years from now. And uh, I like to hand over to our audience. I mean, uh, uh, how about escalation? Should we discuss uh, escalation. Until recently, we said uh, tanks are the red line, but now we demand fast deliveries. Is there anybody here in the audience who is concerned about an escalation of the conflict? We need to talk about that aspect as well. Otherwise, uh, the Zeitenwende, the change of tides uh, is not going to happen. The microphone is going to come for you to take it. I think the biggest problem we have is the strategy. Where is our strategy? Where is our strategic thinking? And the second uh, situation goes back to what the Moldavian, uh, Moldova ambassador says. He talked about the difficulty of Moldova. Uh, 
we have talked about how can we make sure that a country like Russia gets firmly criticized in the United Nations, in the Security Council. And the idea that the General Assembly took a decision twice, of course, it's a thing we have to counter. I mean, when you look at the result of the votes in the General Assembly, we have so many question marks still. There were countries who did not endorse the vote. These are important countries as political actors. And that also shows the illusions that we have. Uh, we always believed in the OSCE. Look at Moldova, uh, the spoiler function uh, was created, and we just watched the OSCE missions negotiating, and there was never, never a true stabilization of uh, Moldova. And Lavrov said, uh, this government uh, is really incredible, and we have to call it in question. It must be completely ousted. He clearly said, this minister Lavrov, that this regime in Moldova is a regime they cannot accept. And this is the concern we have to uh, uh, respond to. So where is a strategy? You said it's difficult to find such a strategy, but where is it? And the second problem we have, we have no unity in the EU. We have uh, so many activities uh, that are contravening our efforts. Unfortunately, the EU, when it comes to security, hasn't developed any firm structures. They started in the 90s. Uh, the Foreign Office of Germany has tried to develop initiatives with uh, France, but they were never uh, they were never um, effective in the long run because there are too many particular interests. How can we support the rear of the front? Because there are particular interests in France. They want to be involved in the production, and they are afraid that the Germans are going to take over and be too successful, uh, like, for instance, a company like Rheinmetall. And when we talk about national sovereignty, uh, there are too many countries who are still too much afraid to give up part of their own uh, sovereignty. And here I agree with the facilitator, 10 years are not a long period. Yes, qualified majority decisions, one ca a buzzword, one catchword. So many more questions. and. Uh, Everybody who is following us on, on the live stream, you can use uh, the hashtag uh, Outpour 2020 to, uh, 2023 to ask your questions via Twitter. I have a somewhat difficult question, and my question goes back to what was said by Ms. Pogger. All autocrats oppress and kill their opponents inside and outside uh, the country. Of course, many Russians are against the war. And of course, many Germans were against the Second World War. But of course, there's also a lot of support for Russia because of the disinformation it spreads. So what can we do about that? How can we continue to talk and have relations, not with Putin, but with Russian citizens? What can the West do? What can the world do to assist and so help Russian people in the situation they are in? What can we do now? And what is the strategy of the EU and the federal government of Germany? Vielleicht generell. I would like to pass on this question connected to the following question. Why are we so bad to do propaganda ourselves? And of course, I'm exaggerating here, but um, why can all those uh, billions that are being spent, uh, I mean, spend a lot of money in the Balkans, but when China or Russia, for example, opens a bridge there and invests into the building of a bridge there, then there's a huge celebration. So uh, I'm, uh, I think that we have to do much more homework, basically. And I mean, there's so many different topics that have been raised in the different contributions. So disinformation and propaganda is very relevant. And also the way in which we deal with it. And as you said, we are investing a lot throughout the world, but we are always very modest about it. And I know that also our 
foreign minister would like to make this more visible in the future. But on the one hand, it should never be propaganda. We need much more strategic communication. Um, we have to assess where the next lies or disinformation could come from. The Americans did a great job. Um, this was a moment which was quite frightening when we heard the first narratives of bioweapon labs in Ukraine or when we think back a year when there was a discussion about a potential uh, beginning of a war, even though it did not prevent the war, of course. But um, so these are the things that we should think about and that we should become better. And this has nothing to do, of course, with propaganda or lies, but basically with effect-based uh, political discourse. And discourse, discussion, of course, always leads to certain disagreement, and we have to cope with that, of course. But um, we've also seen it throughout the pandemic, where many people said, well, the autocracies will manage the pandemic better. But uh, at the moment, we see also in view of China that uh, the model where we usually are quite negative about um, that it's not that bad. We did manage the pandemic quite well. And I would also um, say this for uh, European um, unity. And of course, here we have Sophia Vesh, who can explain it much better, who is responsible or the culprit in the EU or not. But of course, this would go too far here. But um, <clears throat> honestly speaking, this is um, one of the most important aspects in our strategy against Putin. We have to create European unity. And of course, there are spoilers. We are not perfect. And also how we discuss who is going to deliver what is not always the best way uh, in terms of good political strategic uh, communication. But I've never seen the European Union that unanimous and so capable to act irrespective of a majority decision or not. And what can we do with the people in order to counter disinformation? Of course, we are also doing something. We try to launch information channels to provide English-speaking information. I mean, there's no free press in Russia anymore. And um, the people who have fought within the country against the system, and nobody knows it better than the Heinrich Böll Foundation, have been killed in the meantime. They are in exile or imprisoned. And the surveys that we know from Russia have confirmed in a very sad way what I could hardly believe. So. I invited Ukrainian women to my constituency office and all the women told me their own stories of a brother, an uncle, um, an aunt um, or other relatives who they told how they had to flee or sat in the tunnels of the subway, how frightened they were because of the um, nearing uh, shells and, and rockets. However, the Russian relatives did not believe them. So the disinformation is so strong and so convincing that they did not believe them. So we have to strengthen critical voices, which is, of course, very difficult in the current situation. And we have to see that large part of the population in Russia accepts this war and supports this um, war. And the most opposition uh, could be seen because of the partial mobilization of the population, but not because they were against this war, but out of concern for their own security. To add a few words on um, Russia and the way I think uh, we also missed a very important point when Ru Russian propaganda started dehumanizing Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that uh, we've taken it, well, it's just Putin preaching to his people, but he was preparing his people for war, to commit all these war crimes that are now recorded over 60,000 uh, across Ukraine, and there's a major mission to actually hold perpetrators accountable for that. Um, in, I, I think uh, in the modern world, of course, it's psychologically uncomfortable. Even the information is available. You will stay in your bubble and you would not go out. I think we shouldn't worry too much for Russians. They're able to flee if they want to flee from mobilization. There are routes open through Serbia and through Turkey and through other places. I think the West has been quite generous in accepting Russian intellectuals, in giving them fellowships, including many here in Berlin. 
uh, I think what we have to be thinking about, uh, about collective responsibility of Russian people for this war, uh, and something that Germany went through, accepting collective responsibility for what happened in the Second World War, um, Russians will have to accept that too. Otherwise, Russia simply will have no future. This is not because we want to punish Russia. It's not about punishment. It's about understanding that you as a citizen are culpable for the way your government turns out to be. Um, and where are Russian protests anti-war in, in the West? Have you, have you had much in Berlin? Russian community protesting against uh, war? I have not seen it in London. This is a relative security, you would say. Um, and, and I guess until Russian people show that courage and bravery, they will have no, um, no chance of, of a different Russia. On that side, I think what could be done to kind of fertilize an idea of a different Russia is having a conversation with those Russians living in exile, studying abroad, about the vision for a different Russia. Because uh, when we talk about security for Ukraine or Moldova or uh, Belarus, we have to understand that until there's change in Russia, until there is revolution in the elite, that this doctrine that Putin put Russia on is doomed, failed, and uh, dangerous for Russia itself, there will be no sec security. I mean, there will be some will be able to manage, uh, contain, perhaps deter. But uh, really, on European continent, we have to all be thinking about the transformation of Russia again into a normal state. That, and that is the task for the Russians themselves. And we can help them having a place to discuss that in the relative safely, safety of the West. I would like to add something in terms of Russian disinformation. The problem and what makes it so difficult to think about uh, possibilities of um, engaging Russians. For example, from the Finnish perspective, it's the one million dollar question. So how can we, I mean, we have this long border, we are neighbors. So how can we practically engage in the future again? And of course, it's best when there are not much tensions. But in order to achieve this, would the prerequisite be that we share the same reality? And this is not the case at the moment. And the problem about Russian disinformation and what makes it so difficult and what we also see in the West, in Germany and all the Western countries, in the US with fake news and everything. So the problem is not that the Russian propaganda or disinformation is so convincing that people say, oh, it makes sense. Quite the contrary. Yes, it's very bad at times. Exactly. It's really crazy at times where you think, well, what the heck are they saying there? But it manages to instill this tiny little doubt in people. So where people think that nothing is, is, is true and everything is possible. So, so it's quite obvious that Russian state media are no reliable information sources, but they managed to instill this uh, grain of doubt in people so that they do no longer believe in any sources. They think that there is no reliable um, re uh, resource or no source at all. So everyone has an agenda and this leads to a situation where, I mean, put differently, in societies it's very important that we share the same reality and that this is reflected in the media. And if this crumbled, basically, then this makes political processes or decision-making processes in societies much more difficult. If people um, do not think uh, based on the same assumptions. And we see this in the West as in Russia. This is something where we really have to start also in the Western countries. Well, I was about to, to mention it. the uh, Steve Bannon, the presidential advisor, um, said it quite simple. He said, this is flooding the zone with shit. So this is the strategy. So you... Um, put so much nonsense out in the world so that people no longer know what they should believe. 
And this is really a huge problem. I would fully agree to that. And we also heard about the EU. I mean, at the EU level, there is some kind of unit for strategic communication, but they are only focused on Russia. And I mean, no? Yes, OK. And um, I'm just thinking loud here. So I mean, it's not only Russia. Russia is not the only actor who is acting like that and and um, spreading disinformation. And one other thought, the Putinism might remain, even though Putin might be gone eventually. And the difficulty that I see is that um, this historic comparison with Germany is for many reasons very difficult. But one thing we can say for sure, it it is not possible to compare period at the point where we talk about the conditions that made that were created and that made Germany develop in the way it developed. So Germany was um, occupied Germ and, and this will not happen in Russia, basically. Uh, Germany was also demilitarized, so this will not happen. So how should we create the conditions that allow for this transformation and um, also a transformation for the Russian populations in order to population in order to create a different kind of Russia? So that's very difficult. But I'm talking way too much. Um, One condition to create is to make sure Russia loses in Ukraine that Russian army is defeated on the territory of its neighbor, Ukraine. That will, I mean, to be honest, from the moment Putin ordered this, what he calls special military operation, he set in motion inside Russia processes that we not fully see. That includes the competition of elites, that includes shrinking pie of resources that will put pressure on already quite dysfunctional Putin system. I think what that would lead, and we've seen in Russian history, when Russia was losing wars, and Russia was losing wars, let's not delude ourselves, the Crimean War, the war to Japan, after that there were, right? Uh, and, you know, um, Afghanistan. After that, you have a period of opening, reform, change, what do you call it? And this is the moment where Russians have to be ready, where we have to be ready, not to repeat mistakes of the 90s and take everything that they tell us for face value. And I think one of the preconditions where we now, where we are, the silver lining is that if we, and I think there will be time when Russian leadership will want to come back to the G7, will want to come back to global trade, to global uh, technology, they will have to comp uh, comply with international agreements. They violated over 30 agreements throughout this last decade. So if they want to be back on global stage, they will have to comply. And that will also put a framework. I think we should be very clear that it's OK to have conditions for Russia. It's OK. You know, we have conditions for Ukraine when Ukraine wants to become a member of European Union. If Russia wants to be a member of global community, it's OK to have conditions. And it's, I think this overcoming this fear of speaking truth to Russia, or truth to power, is that I think we are also depriving Russians that want change in Russia. I'm sure there are. I mean, they, when they, they, they understand the split between propaganda and, and reality, and this will happen. Right now, they disengage. They disengage like at the late Soviet times. They are not cheering so much. All these rallies for Putin are paid. They want to stay in their kitchens, do not touch them, do not take our sons. But unfortunately, this is a bit too late. So I think this is how I see the process of change that could trigger uh, without occupation of Russian Federation. Fragen. Um, ich, genau, wir gehen hier in die erste Reihe und gehen quasi mal von links nach rechts und wir sammeln. In the first row and we go from left to right and we will collect a few questions. Uh, I am from India. It's my independent uh, sort of outside view. But I, I think my question would be on uh, consensus and moving fast, right? I, I think the, I would like to put it in maybe three or four sentences. If you take history in 50 years back, and I, I think the interventions in Vietnam or interventions in Afghanistan or Iraq or anything, I, I think the interventions were fast in terms of because or 
maybe because of you were dealing with a smaller power or you were dealing with a non-nuclear power or you were dealing with something uh, you know, which was okay, you had good gain consensus first. And it once it comes to Russia or in terms of action, uh, my question is how much of this is playing on the minds of, you know, consensus making and driving? Because this also sets a different precedent uh, outside of Europe, uh, within Taiwan, within South Korea, within Japan, uh, within India. Uh, I think in terms of just analyzing the action, right? And I think I would go with the Moldovan ambassador's uh, uh, point of view on, uh, you know, supplying 3,000 tanks and 3,000, 2,000 vehicles. It's, I think the, the time of World War II was different uh, in terms of you could take action, put these things because the nuclear question was not on the agenda. It is the agenda now. So I think the consensus making sets a different uh, thinking process outside when the you know Brazilians are looking at it or we are looking at it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have one more Thank you very much. We will collect two to three other questions. So in the front row and then we will go to the back. Michael de Schreier. Michael de Schreier, former member of the European Commission. And as such, I would also like to defend the European defense and security policy. In the European Treaty, we also have a, an assistance commitment clause, not only NATO, but also the EU 42.5, exactly. And we know that there is a difference between the European capabilities and or also NATO capabilities, but this European assistance commitment is worth something isn't it? I mean, at least Mr. Zelensky sees it differently. This is also one of the reasons why he is so adamant to become a EU member. And the question of EU membership is irreversible since yesterday. This promise is standing, um, irrespective of any negotiations with Russia in the future. This is standing. And this means that also this uh, assistance commitment from U uh, EU to Ukraine is binding. And in the European Treaty, it's also laid out that all the member states are obliged to strengthen their capabilities that, and that in, if necessary, this assistance uh, regulation should be applied and they should not only support other members with light tanks but with everything they've got available in military terms in order to defend the other member states. So this is quite a very strong regulation. And when it was entered into the treaty, of course, we never expected that it might eventually someday uh, be applied. But still, we have this commitment which is binding for all the member states. This is also my question to, to the panel. So is this also something that plays a role in the policy um, or political debates at the national level? So, and EU and NATO, of course, is not a contradiction. Uh, also, NATO, of course, is being strengthened when the EU has more defense capabilities. So, this is quite clear. So, my question is, is this something that uh, is this European defense capability and also the knowledge that we do have this, this assistance commitment, does this play a role in the political debate at the national level? Oh, Agnieszka Brugger has to go too, so we have to hand over to our panelists. I am awfully sorry, I have to go back to Parliament. But let me respond. Of course, I would like to rather stay with you, not go back to Parliament, because it's one of the, my favorite topics in a way. Uh, I do understand uh, we have a lot to do still, a lot of homework to do in the EU in order to strengthen our um, security policy. It's like in the financial crisis, everybody wanted to save as much money as possible. Now we are all uh, wanting to spend uh, as much money as possible. So I'm never happy uh, with uh, the way we uh, coordinate our efforts in the EU. Uh, 
So instead of uh, sort of uh, using all kinds of different systems, uh, all kinds of different national modifications, let's go together. Let me say the European uh, defense capabilities are a relevant part of NATO, of course, and uh, that is why it's not a contradiction, NATO and the EU. And then thirdly, what was the starting point? The discussion that Ukraine wants to become a member of NATO has been going on for a very long time. When Ukraine wanted to get closer to the EU in 2040, it all began. And that is why the EU is not such a powerless uh, structure. It is such an attractive thing, and it's a threat for all the autocrats uh, or in the world. And that's one of the many motives uh, for Putin's war. I'm very happy for this intervention from China. I was in India together with Annalena Bierbock, and let me say, of course, it's not only the discussion we have on the level of uh, the General Assembly where we try to convince states that are dependent on Russia or China. Um, there's so many different factors. And so we do have many critical things. In India, for instance, I was asked, where were you when China uh, won attempted something similar at our border to the Himalayas? Uh, well, of course, we should have been present. We should have supported more. And we also had discussions about why some of the sanctions are not as sharp as they should be. And there are uh, many reasons for that, uh, in, um, economic consequences, uh, dependencies. But sometimes there was another background argument. Because we thought about the sanctions uh, that we impose and that could uh, be dangerous for the countries of the global south. And that is why we wanted to make sure that it is not only the EU, Canada, and the United States that participate in the sanctions. So it's not just one perfect long-term plan. Everybody can endorse, everybody can follow. Of course, uh, things are never completely perfect. But these are very important questions that we always have to have at the back of our mind because it's our common world order. And at the end of the day, all peaceful people in the world are going to suffer if Putin's example uh, spills over. That was a very good final statement for our member of parliament. Thank you very much for being with us. Bundestag, of course, parliament is important. You cannot ignore Parliament. I have one more idea. I do agree with you. And of course, there are only a few people who know about uh, Article 42, the mutual assistance guarantee within the EU. And it's even uh, much more pointed than Article Number 5 in NATO. But of course, it was never tested. We hope very much we will never have to test this Article uh, 42, but um, indeed it is there. There was somebody over there who's been waiting for a long time to ask a question. Now we hand over to you. I'm Harald Möller. I'm a historian and a member of the Green Party. I've got a remark and a question regarding the uh, further existence of Putinism. Given the current situation, there are two alternatives we might think of. For instance, uh, a resumption of the war, and all of that could escalate into a nuclear war. This last alternative is somebody is nobody wishing for. Nobody here in this room would want to have a nuclear uh, escalation and uh, continuation. But what will happen after a victory of Ukraine? If Ukraine uh, frees uh, Donbass and uh, Crimea, what will happen in Ukraine? Uh, being a historian, I think we could have a repetition of a situation that we used to have in uh, the November Revolution in 2018. Putin definitely wouldn't survive that. What is your idea? What will happen 
in uh, Russia in the case of a war of a victory of Ukraine. Um, is Let me take this question uh, regarding. Uh, the Mutual Assistance Clause, uh, Article 42.7, that was interesting in Finland and Sweden. First of all, the uh, wording was watered down in a uh, half paragraph saying that some countries are non-aligned countries and there's a difference between NATO member states that will organize their defense through NATO and the other five states, Finland, Sweden, Malta and Cyprus and Ireland and Austria, the non-aligned countries. Finland invested a great deal. First of all, Finland was basically skeptical vis-a-vis -vis this whole thing because it wasn't so convincing. It was not very clear how this article would be implemented in the event of such a disaster. Finland is a very pragmatic country. And they said, OK, if Russia uh, crossed the border, what would that mean? What would it trigger? What mechanisms would start working? It's a comprehensive article, but the mechanisms, the real mechanisms are not clearly formulated. And then they were very skeptical about writing something into it that sounds good, but uh, doesn't is not really substantiated and cannot be practically implemented. But then Finland tried very hard to take these words and see how they could become reality. And so there was a lot of discussion about uh, this mutual assistance clause and uh, would it be very helpful in case of an adverse event. And the conclusion was, I mean, the problem is that in the common security and defense policy, the CSDP, there is not enough unity. There are no, not enough practical mechanisms, and that is why NATO membership at the end of the day would be necessary because most EU members are NATO members as well. And of course, uh, NATO is a defense alliance, and the EU is so much more, and security and defense policy is less important within the framework of the EU. In the Swedish NATO report in May last year, there was an assessment of that uh, assistance clause. The Swedish said, well, this assistance clause does exist, but it's worth nothing in practice because there is not enough political unity to really practically do something. That was the Swedish conclusion, and that was the reason why Sweden applied for NATO membership. And of course, NATO also includes the United States and the UK, which means they have much larger capacities. But it's an interesting thing about uh, the way Finland dealt with the mutual assistance clause of the EU. Of course, it's a question uh, that might not be resolved, uh, but we shouldn't forget about it. Uh, now, your question, uh, uh, escalation, war, what if Ukraine wins? What if we have a nuclear escalation? Our panelists, you know, I hope we still stay. You stay, right? I'll so, be here, yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> Well, thank you for staying. You know, if it's only the panelists, I think we're doing okay. Uh, it's it's a very heavy question. You know, I mean, I think I mean, first Ukraine lives in the shadow of nuclear accident Chernobyl, right? Let's let's remember it's not something hypothetical in Ukraine. This happened. This happened in my generation, and I remember actually that the first internal displacement IDPs now that we all use happened after Chernobyl. Excellent. Just a little um, sketch that my friend in London hosts a girl from Poltava where she fled from Kyiv as a child when Chernobyl exploded. So um, Ukrainians understand the danger of nuclear and I think that they um, uh, 
occupation of Zaporizhia nuclear power station, and here I'm focusing more on civilian nuclear, because we often forget about that element while talking about some tactical nuclear attack or, God forbid, you know, any nuclear weapon being used. I think that the risk of, this is the, probably the first interstate conflict where you have such risk over this nuclear civilian, and Russia deliberately pressing these buttons. That is why Ukrainian government is working to recognize Russia as a state that is using terror against Ukrainians. The, the terrorist state, such a strong um, word is being used, is because of the tactics of the shelling um, of uh, so close to the power station. We had the general director of International Atomic Agency speaking in Chatham House. You can watch his video. It, it, he gave a good... Um, uh, update about what happens. I think very smart decision from Ukraine to invite uh, AA to all nuclear power stations. So there is a kind of an effort for protection of the civilian nuclear uh, facilities. Now on the bigger scale, I think that um, it, the risk of nuclear has been taken seriously and handled mainly by the United States, but also other nuclear um, uh, countries and Russians failed to deter through say nuclear sable rattling I think I think that is already a past story I think it was a very resolute response to all, of all nuclear states you remember when Russians were threatening with a dirty bomb that Ukraine is dirty bomb over the summer right before they lost her son um, and I think it was handled well uh, I, I think Russians understand all the options on the table in, on the occasion of such uh, possibility, and this will not be any nuclear option. The answers will be conventional and bad for Russia. Uh, that is why I think the likelihood of that is, is scenario is not high. We see that Russians are actually pushing conventional means. That's why they are mobilizing their people. That's why they are uh, putting old stockpile of weapons. They still will be using conventional means in this war against Ukraine and not a, a, a nuclear means. Crimea is something that wasn't mentioned, and I know there's a lot of fear also in the West, uh, especially with these Ukra giving Ukrainians longer range missiles, will they attack uh, uh, Crimea? I mean, Crimea is as annexed illegally as um, Donbass or as uh, Zaporizhia or as Kherson or, or Kharkiv. There, we should not be making any distinction between that. Uh, I think this war started from Crimea, right? This war didn't start on the 23rd of February. And it must end with the resolution of the status of Crimean Peninsula, not just for the sake of Ukraine, all Crimean Tatars who are indigenous population in Crimea, but for the sake of Black Sea security, for the sake of security of navigation, for the sake of food security, that we do see now how uh, millions are suffering because Ukrainian grain cannot freely flow to where it's needed. Um, that is why I think we should respond to this blackmail with firmness and also um, ensure that Ukraine coordinates its military campaign, which we know it does. You've seen today's Washington Post talking about intelligence shell, including coordinates before Ukraine uh, launches uh, um, any serious uh, high Mars uh, uh, missiles, uh, the coordinates are shared to reassure partners. And I think that is the evidence of that uh, managing the nuclear threat, which is a very difficult. I think we've never been in this kind of situation in, in modern history. And I hope we, the decision makers will do everything right, but it's very complicated. Is this, um, but is this also it's also interesting to note the discussion that we have in Germany now after the Bali meeting and these clear-cut messages that also came from India and China. Well, of course, Russia once again tried to, to instigate nuclear fears by using the rhetoric of uh, the uh, dirty bomb. But now the rhetoric has uh, reduced. And Chancellor Schultz said uh, now the nuclear threat is uh, 
now taken uh, back in a way. We have uh, stood up so firmly they are afraid of threatening. But in September, Putin said the un annexed territories will be declared state territory of the Russian Federation and will therefore be under the nuclear defense shield. So we have to see that the risk is still there. Let me add something about long-term strategies. There's one thing that's very complicated. Let's look at Crimea. Can uh, Ukraine uh, can the Ukraine reconquer uh, Crimea militarily? That's a totally different problem. It's also a question of the fear of escalation. I don't think the risk is very high. It's not an acute risk. So the nuclear threat should not guide our day-to-day -day decisions, but we should have it on our mind. So the escalation risk is there. If Russia might be afraid of losing Crimea, they may pull the nuclear card again. But strategically, basically, we would like to render the Ukraine capable of triggering that fear. Putin must be afraid of losing Crimea. Otherwise, he will never uh, go to the negotiation table. It's a wicked problem, as they say in English. Uh, it's a paradoxical situation. So we have to promote something we want to prevent from happening. So I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of uh, people who have to take decisions today. Now, I will hand over to our panelists, but we have to watch for time. Sometimes it's a bit absurd to this escalation debate in Germany because this escalation debate is just looking at the nuclear capabilities. But uh, uh, Russia is escalating all the time in Ukraine in extreme ways. We shouldn't forget about that in Germany either. So we are too much focused on the nuclear escalation because that might hit us here in Berlin. I personally think that's very unlikely, but of course it's it's a it's a fear that people have. But we shouldn't forget about the escalation uh, that goes on and is executed by Russia in uh, Ukraine. Now. A couple of words about Crimea. Crimea is very important for Russian military operations. It's a, a very important base. So if we want Ukraine to live in peace, we have to have in mind what the Russians are using Crimea for. Uh, what Washington Post wrote was now mentioned here as well in order to say that it is necessary to uh, deliver longer range missiles because the Ukraine is always acting in coordination with the allies. Uh, do we still have five minutes? Now, let me see who else hasn't had the floor yet. Sophia Besh and in the second row and the lady over there. Three more statements. I also have another plan with you, so make sure you ask very brief questions, because at the end, I want to do something different. Sophia Bash from, Car from the Carnegie Endowment, I wanted to say something about the EU question and EU sovereignty. Two brief issues. If we want European sovereignty, uh, we have to take the decisions now to have this EU sovereignty in 15 years. And once we talk about capability to act of uh, the EU, I also think we should not always just look at NATO and uh, not only say that uh, NATO is uh, strong, NATO is the most important operational defense alliance in Europe. What the EU can do is integrate markets. This is what the EU has been doing for decades. The European defense markets and armament market must be integrated. Anisha already talked about that. It's about common procurement, uh, coordinated procurement. We are missing major opportunities right here and now. Uh, procurement times, development, research and development uh, times are long, 10 to 15 years at least, but we have to take decisions now. And here, 
we need more proactive action in uh, Germany as well in order to make Brussels uh, an integrator for the European defence market. The Poland is now buying Abrams and not lepers is basically a catastrophe and it creates a, a dependence that we will not be able to get rid of for the next decades. Well, Mr. Zawa, you uh, explicitly asked for the escalation and in uh, some parts of our population, this is really a major concern. However, a little bit exaggerated when it comes to my personal analysis, but it's not, it, it's still a possibility, not only a theoretical possibility. And some um, political science say, well, highly likely or not. So we would have to discuss different scenarios that might lead to different. Um, a different level of uh, possibility, so to speak. Um, so many th think that escalation means that the whole world or half of the globe would be involved or even destroyed, but this is not true. An escalation might also be limited through reason, maybe, and who will be mostly affected. Mostly affected will be those countries that are faced with geopolitical disadvantages because they are very close to this region or they do not have nuclear uh, warheads themselves. So Olaf Scholz might not remember many things, but I think he quite well remembers the, the issue of the enhanced deterrence. And this is a topic. Of course, the Americans are doing much more than all the others together for Ukraine. However, the risk eventually will be much higher for others. So this is the second contribution that you can make in the fight for Ukraine. Um, and we, the Germans, are a little bit negligent here when it comes to this. But there's a special risk for Germany. And so far, it's quite right to urge the Americans that they deliver their Abrams. Um, of course, they come up with some uh, explanations that we also know from our own politicians. So up until the last minute, where the new minister had to say that he first has to count all the tanks before he can promise the delivery. And um, the Americans uh, might only deliver by the end of the year and not earlier. So uh, the Americans are delivering many things, but so far not the tanks. And this has a reason. So fair share of the risk, not only of the contribution, but also of the risk uh, is something that we need. So some countries might be particularly affected at the moment, and this is not being taken into account so far. Thank you very much. Now over to you. Hello. Welcome. My name is Claudia Zasse. I am a green local politician from Preen am Kinsey. This is quite far away from here. And for 30 years, or more than 30 years, I've got friends in the former Soviet Union that uh, now spread across all the former Soviet countries and also in exile. And I've, I'm constantly faced with the question, how are we supposed to um, act in the future? And this has been discussed extensively here, but two questions remain that I would like to pose. So one, how do you consider the risk of a disassembling, basically, uh, of Russia if Ukraine wins or disintegration of Russia. This is something that I'm asked frequently, where people who are coming from Russia, uh, bright hands, are also um, fearing this. And the second question is quite a simple one. I've got many question, uh, sorry, many friends with whom I constantly have to discuss the following. Why do we support Ukraine and why aren't we negotiating? So this is basically very simplified. Um, and I no longer want to hear it. But still, I'm faced with this question on a daily basis. And I tend to um, lack the arguments, or um, I no longer have enough arguments. And I would like to get more <laughs> input from you here at this point. Thank you. I would like to pass this on immediately. So this question is quite easy. Uh, to answer, Russia does not want to negotiate. Of course, you cannot negotiate on your own. And then I would like to pick up another aspect. I do not understand the special German risk. So we are all faced with the same risk. And um, this uh, debate is not really comprehensible from my point of view. 
I think that uh, Germany now finally gets the feel for the threat. However, those countries who have been closer to Russia uh, have been living um, with that fear for quite a long time. So yes, fair share. Okay, but I do not understand this specific German risk in this connection. We should clarify that. I mean, you were talking about nuclear sharing and uh, also, I mean, we are, might be a more exposed uh, target because we have the B61s here, um, that we are rather a target than, than Switzerland, for example. What did you mean? Yes. So I think the problem is that we basically forgot that we are threatened by nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, it's not as if after the beginning of the 1990s there were no nuclear weapons uh, anymore. So they just need seven minutes to Berlin and we are all uh, uh, end up in a vapor and we not realize what happened. But I think we all forgot about that. Well. This might be one aspect that is, is uh, right. So, please. I think we have to accept the fact that we are not managing a crisis, right? I mean, I think what is happening, we are still applying the tools and mind uh, framework of managing a crisis. This is there's a war in, on European continent. We cannot take old tricks and try to create a new reality. And this is why I, I agree. Um, that we should plan now long term and that planning long regardless of how you know what the war geography will look like because we still don't know there's summers you know spring summer campaign coming up that we'll be fighting but we need to um, get again our house in order in terms of delivering on NATO requirements for what it is on spending capabilities, um, uh, warming up military production, integrating defense and security complex. And, and I think um, we must understand that this is deterrence. This is deterrence because only when we get serious, Putin will understand or whoever is in the Kremlin will take it seriously. And, 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 and I think that on the question about negotiating, you know, a very simple say to say, you have a, you know, a bandit coming into your kitchen, breaking the rules, occupying it, and he wants to declare a no police zone around your house so that nobody touches him. This is how Putin negotiates. He wants us to accept his reality, but not only that territorial occupation, he wants us to accept his worldview. By negotiating with Putin, we're saying, yes, we agree to your worldview. And I think we, we don't want to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, concluding, I would like to do one thing. Giorgio, quite quickly. You all found these cards, one green and one red card. And I would like to go back to the beginning and uh, pick up what Mr. Rasmussen has said and um, basically measure the temperature in this room. He said, can the price of freedom be too high? So who thinks, yes, there might be a price that we do not want to pay for freedom should hold up the red card, no, quite abstract, so freedom of the people. Or those who say, well, I do agree to it, freedom is so important, such an important value that we would pay any price for it, should hold up the green card. So I can do the following, there are two, four, six, eight, ten, 12, 13 red cards and all the other cards that were held up are green. And Georgia, I can say that the Zeitenwende has been accomplished in the Bell Foundation. So now we have to make sure that the rest of the country follows suit. So thank you very much to the great panelists, those who are still here. One big round of applause, please. And, of course, a big thanks to the audience for your participation. I'm still a little bit uh, um, astonished. This is not the kind of discussion or feedback that you necessarily get at the Bell Foundation usually, but I think that it's quite good, and I was really happy about that. So please enjoy the rest of the conference. 
Thank you very much, Frank. Before I let you uh, go into your lunch break, just a piece of information. You can go one stair down. There's a snack and something to drink. And in one hour from now, we will hear the foreign minister. If you would like to uh, do something culturally, so to speak, um, in the lunch break, you can take a look at our exhibition on this Belletage and Walter Kaufmann might tell you one or the other thing about it, maybe Walter, you can briefly tell us something about it. So if you go through that door or out here, it's on the left-hand side. It's a great photo exhibition. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. You, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's culture, but it's not really a cultural event, so to speak. But um, you can see the pictures of four Russian photographers there. who actually um, show the personal shock um, about February the 24th. They talk about dying flight and the insanity of this aggression and this um, um, adaptation to this situation of need and the hidden protests in Russia. The situations that are being depicted that could not be uh, more different. Two of the photographers have taken the pictures in Ukraine and in the Republic of Moldova. They have taken pictures of uh, Ukrainian refugees in Moldova and two took pictures in Moscow under the impression of the propaganda and the uh, and uh, some protests there. And with their personal impressions and texts, the artists want to express their um, view on the war. They explicitly want to differentiate themselves from the passive um, acceptance of the war of the general population and they want to counter this Russian discourse of hate. This exhibition is a cooperation um, with, of the Sakharov Foundation with the uh, Dialogue Office for Civil Society Cooperation East and Southeast Europe in Vienna, which cooperates with us. And as George has already said, it's behind the wardrobe on this floor right across the Ukrainian embassy, basically, uh, when you look outside. So, and I wish you a nice lunch break. Thank you.